Alrighty, it is two minutes past eleven. A very, very good morning to you. Welcome to the Midday Show with me, Ifanaya, here on Lagos Rocks 91.3. As always, expect nothing short of goodness. Starting with the people's perspective, that show where we get to dissect a pertinent and topical issues from your perspective. And yes, you have the floor to, at any point in time, join the conversation call us up send us tweets send us whatsapp messages let us have these different conversations and let's have conversations that are not actually being had as always in the studio i have and i always introduce him as my unequivocal <laughs> co-host <laughs> Sheo and Nicola Pocuzzi. i say the only reason i do this show is because of the introduction <laughs> <laughs> i like that <laughs> Your wife say, "Oh, Mori, me woo is making my head swell up." It's making yes, double the size. Oh my double gosh, that's really interesting. Anyways, guys, um, a whole lot has happened this week, and we're going to be going through um a bunch of topics. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to touch on lightly. So we're not going in depth per se, but yeah. lightly on a few stories like the update on the NDDC saga and Whisper Gate. Wait, first of all, this Whisper Gate. Let me was give you Whisper Gate. Okay. I named it Whisper Gate because they, they recorded like, Oshio Molly and Gambari. Why am I not seeing Whisper Gate anywhere? <laughs> yeah. Why am I just hearing it yeah. from Shell? Okay, so you yeah, know yeah. they gave me Whisper Gate. They, 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 they didn't know they were being recorded. They were, they were whispering the downfall of somebody. They were okay. whispering. Mm. <laughs> so that so was Whisper Gate. And after that, we're going to talk about. <laughs> we're going to be talking about um, maybe touch on the Oyo serial killer uh, uh, story and the update on that. And we're going to take a look at the Ghana Nigeria relations. We've seen what's been going on, especially very recently with the Nigerian traders in Ghana. We're going to yeah. touch on that, and then we're going to touch on the Mali coup. And I, I believe that Shane was very interested in the Mali coup. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm here today. Fantastic. That's why I'm here today. Okay, so quickly, <laughs> let's breeze through it. For the NDDC, we've all been inundated with the recent NDDC saga that's been ongoing. We all know this. Part of the litany of corruption allegations under investigation currently um, began in May, that is this year, when the Senate and the House of Representatives, they resolved to investigate members of the Interim Management Committee of the NDDC over allegations of mismanaging 40 billion naira within three months. <laughs> Now, the two chambers subsequently set up an ad hoc pro panel to look into the financial transactions of the IMC. And the acting managing director. The acting. Acting. I mean, what emphasizes the acting. The acting. Uh -huh. Of the NDGC, that is the Niger Delta <laughs> Development Commission, Professor Ponde. I mean, talk about, sorry, if you were talk about taking your title. <laughs> okay, to acting. Heart. Taking your title. I see, you see, when they refuse to give you the I'm job, you, say, you are acting. But you say, hey, then you take that title to heart. I mean, I, I mean, Africa. Africa. <laughs> hey, leave. So, we also what happened um, during the probing of, of the allegations of, of the financial mismanagement and fraud, alleged fraud, at the commission. And this was by the House of Representatives Committee. When this was happening, we saw that uh, the acting managing director of the NDDC, Pondi, he lost consciousness. You know, he passed out. People were trying to resuscitate him, so to speak. Um, it seemed quite dramatic for the general public. Now he has responded to all the criticism that came with what happened on that day. Uh, people termed it as a dramatic display. He said, and I quote, <laughs> I had an unexplained, unexpected health challenge. It is ridiculous to think that people believe that I was acting. I will not pray for anyone to experience what I went through. I do not <clears> run from issues. I have put all that behind me. Well, he, he has to when you're not in jail. <laughs> I, I mean, when you're not in jail, after you mismanage that kind of amount of money, you know, are you are able to just do some kind of, I mean, I don't no, want to touch okay. on that too much. I think it's just also should gloss over and just let the exactly. audience know where these people's uh, mentality is at, you know. He doesn't wish what happened to him on anybody else. Sorry, sir, we Nigerians too do not wish what happened, uh, how you ha happened to us. As we don't the wish that. Of the fund. We don't wish that okay. on anybody else. You have. We don't even wish you happening to our worst enemies oh in the world gosh. today. Sorry, sir. Um, all our fans and listeners should please join on our live on my IG live. Okay. Um, Lagos yes. Talks IG live. Yes, on Lagos Talks you know, IG live uh, as well. If you are not in Lagos, you know all our fans all over the world. As I said, this show is in Hollywood, man. 
Um, so, <laughs> I don't know the reason why you've been happening on that. This show is in Hollywood. It's in Hollywood. I want people you, to know the. How no, do you know it's in Hollywood? Nigerians like to attach them, live vicariously through things happening in high places. That what is it? Is it just them. a Nigerian thing? It's a poor people thing generally, but we Nigerians are experts. Ew. We're experts. You know? So we should not try to claim our own if maybe our own happens to be thriving on the global stage. What matters to me is if you no concern me, you no concern me. I mean, <laughs> that's all. I mean, if you, are, if you are thriving while doing something that concerns me, well and good, I'm there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's move on to this term that you've given in this recent video that went viral. So, show according to this is called Whisper Gate. It's Whisper Gate, Talking yes. about Oshomale and Gambari. So, a video actually went viral a few days ago and it's drawn criticism from Nigerians, especially on social media due to the upcoming Edo election um, with uh, many suggesting a possible clampdown on the opposition. Now, in this video, Oshomale was seen walking briskly along Mr. Gambari. Eh? Yeah. just walking. That's what they do back <laughs> <laughs> at the presidential villa and he was muttering words like and i quote and all these things because we can't really we can't really uh uh, uh prove the we don't know hey, the only thing we don't know is what we were talking the about video because the president the presidency has actually responded so we're going to talk about that <laughs> and so with the presidency's response we can't really authenticate the validity of <laughs> that particular video but in the video, what they were heard to be saying was arrest, deal with, and the whole. And everything will change. Arrest, deal with, and everything will change. And then Mr. Gambari responded saying, we will go beyond. So we don't know who they're talking about. We don't know. It's Fela. <laughs> it's Fela they're talking about. I'm telling you. <laughs> so the, the presidency has recently reacted to it and described it as, and I quote, an ingenious patchwork of mischief extracted from an innocent conversation focused on the emerging incidents of violence in the run-up to the election. And uh, who released this statement is the presidential spokesperson, Garba Shehu, saying that this is yet another situation where mischievous individuals have come to patch together you know, several videos, for instance, uh, and taking an innocent conversation out of context, saying that it, it was talking about actually maybe uh, uh, um, bringing to justice or bringing to book those mischievous ones that want to maybe bring violence of some sort during I believe, the, I, the I, elections. I believe it, um, Nigerians of all walks of life have the right to discuss anything they like to discuss, you mm -hmm. know. But when powerful people are talking... There's a certain thing that, you know, is added to the equation, yes. and that is power. You know, so this presidential spokesperson should not just act like this powerful man talking yes. has no effect on our own existence as Nigerians or whoever it is they were talking about. Yeah. And I do not believe that the um, security of the Edo elections should be discussed or, the, um, or rather the policy or the techniques or the way that violence should be curbed during the Edo election should be discussed by the APC chairman and the presidency. This is for our security agencies, yes. independent, neutral, independent and neutral security agencies, if we have anything like that in Nigeria. Exactly. You know, should be the ones, you know, leading the policy and the techniques and the tactics that will be used to curb that during the election. Not uh, our uh, uh, party chairman or ex-party chairman and... Uh, the new um, chief of staff of the president, yes. you know, discussing, you know, uh, the use of um, federal might. In, I mean, I think, I think there's more to be discussed about that. Yeah. And yeah, and, but, but the thing is, we are not, we are not, uh, uh, it's not <coughs> new to see things like this happen during election periods. Yes. We would see that there might be certain mischievous people who would try to put out false information, for instance, so as to paint the opposition party in a bad light. Um, however, if at all, um, we're not because we can't really uh, authenticate this video at the moment. We don't really know what's going on. But if at all certain things were said or certain things were true to have been said, it's not new. Uh, I, I, I sort of liken it to, you know, the BBC documentary about sex for grades, right? Yeah. Well, well Kiki Modi did that. Now, what, what really did that documentary do? It did not uncover uh, um, the rot in the system, the educational system. We already knew that that did exist. What it did was that it shed light. It brought it to light. And so 
if we're talking about several political figures using force during election, it's not news. You know, this is not something new to us. I think also in Nigeria, we tend to want to hide behind the not knowing for a fact. Oh, I don't know. I didn't see it happen. I don't know. For, even though they born old women for turning to oh, wow. beds without anybody seeing this woman ever turning into a bed. But when it comes to our oppressors, everybody wants overwhelming evidence yes. before they can act. You know, <laughs> so I think, you know, it, it's all tied together in, in terms that we as um, modern people need to find a, a way to actually um, hold our media foot to the fire, feet to the fire. Okay. And put it that way, say our journalists need to do more. They need to do more in terms of feeding us unbiased information. I think, and that's the main Very problem that Nigerians have in relating with information out there. It's not the um, fault of poor Nigerians yeah. that they are falling for uh, misinformation. Mm -hmm. It's the fault of those in charge of the platform from make, um, allowing misinformation get to them in the first place. Exactly. But you know, with the rise of social media, can we really blame uh, uh, um, the media houses? Because we have things like Twitter. This did actually go viral on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, but the Twitter, there are certain videos that Twitter takes down. Yes. There are certain things when it affects certain interests. Uh, Facebook, Twitter... Wikipedia, Google, they all come together. Even in Nigeria, I mean, people exclude certain news, exclude certain things. So I think it's it's mainly when it affects the people that things like that are left to the people. Yeah. You know, and I think it shouldn't be so. I think that should also be taken into consideration when uh, information is false. People should be... I mean, but who re what is really for when governments all over the world lie all the time, mm. you know, even when it's, you know, the real news going is a lie. <laughs> so what, what are we doing? What are we trying well, to say? That is interesting. <laughs> the real news is a lie. Anyways, let's quickly move on to um, the last story that we're going to touch on lightly before we go in depth to top stories <coughs> today. Uh, let's just quickly touch on a serial killer escaping in your state. This guy, um, I believe he's 19 years old. And um, he was arrested recently and he was paraded. And um, sadly, while still facing trial and still in the custody of the authorities, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. he escaped. And um, one of the things that they did say was that when he was on his way to the bathroom, you know, who, who really knows what happened? El Chapo teens. <laughs> I mean, that's El Chapo teens, fam. El Chapo too went to the bathroom. Before you know, whoop, disappeared. But, bro, El Chapo teens. Wow. You know? What possible explanation can they give us? When it comes to the fact that this serial killer that was finally apprehended, kept in your custody, he was going to the bathroom. Of course, this is an organized crime. Of course, he had help for this to have happened. Or what? Did he disguise himself? Or did he just tell them, I want to just go out to get some fresh air? I'm trying to understand really what went, what went down. You see, uh, I mean, this kind of um, topic now, I mean, buttress is the last point I was trying to make yeah. to say... Whatever the police comes to tell us now about this situation, is it fake news or is it true? Even from the mouth of the police themselves. That's a very good question. That how do Nigerians? How do Nigerians now even know what is happening with this case? Hmm. You know, uh, Michael Schofield has helped him in one way or the other. I don't know. People watch Prison Break. You know, the guy. I mean, so. <laughs> I mean, I, honestly, I've never heard of a prison break in Nigeria before. Yeah, you haven't. I've never really heard of somebody escaping the prison. It's news. News. Or by news. themselves. Of course, yeah. they usually get help. But by themselves. I've heard of prison break in crowd. Like Boko Haram goes to police station, liberate all the prisoners yeah. out of there by, you know. I've heard of those kind of things. But I'm not in a one prisoner in Nigeria where they don't catch. Like a microscope. Yeah, like when they organize this, you find see, it. let us not downgrade this serial killer. See, alleged, suspected serial killer because he has not been found guilty. Mm. You know, forget that Nigerian police always parade people on TV. Yeah. That's how one of my friends. His name is Tommy. They robbed his neighbor. He said, Baba, this guy is our, our man. Good boy. The sass that came responded to the call after the armed robbers had left. Just saw this boy walking. They locked him up for a month, parading him on TV as arm robber. So we need to be careful. For a month? That's yeah. terrible. So we need to be careful, you know, as I said, you know, who is telling us the truth in Nigeria? Is it the media? Can we listen to the media and say that we as Nigerians are being told the truth? Mm. Can we listen to the authorities and say, oh, that is the truth? So we don't even, I don't even know if the guy is even a serial killer. Hmm, ah, we sure. Now, just just speaking about how we <laughs> show what is you know fake news or authentic news. If not for you know eyewitness reports, I believe that we would have been fed a lot oh of fake news. Oh. 
Because sometimes I'm talking about a particular topic and I'm getting callers saying, oh, if I was there, this is not what happened. Exactly. What the police is saying is totally different from <laughs> what happened right there. And so that's so true. Who do we believe then? It's, it's, it's sad, but um, I'm just hoping that they do more. I believe that this also just shows the rot in our police system. Um, we've been talking about an overhaul and a reformation of the police system, which we're still waiting for. We see that they are very poorly trained, if they are even trained at all. Um, there's a whole lot of corruption the even is, in the, the system as poor. well. The welfare, the welfare is poor. poor. Me too, I will not protect anybody for that kind of salary and that kind of um, welfare. That's I'll be terrible. there protecting myself and who can give me the who can give me my daily bread, you know. So I think all those kind of things, I mean, it was just funny to me too. Anyway, Nigerians, the fact that the guy escaped in the bathroom makes him El Chapo. <laughs> the <laughs> fact that it, he actually escaped makes him Michael Schofield. So this story, just to let you know, that we have a El Chapo, Michael Schofield hybrid criminal on the loose. Everybody look out. Yes. Please yeah. be well, on the Well, the police lookout. is actually asking for, for help as well. <laughs> no, me, so go, I'm asking that you This guy is too dangerous and he's just to be left. he's 19 years old. He's El Chapo and Michael Scofi mixed oh. together. <laughs> okay, uh, let's quickly move on to other stories. Well, let's maybe just get a call. We received reports about the unfair treatment of Nigerian traders in Ghana during the enforcement of the Ghana Investment Promotion Council regulations saying that the traders must pay the required taxes and other fees imposed on them by the authorities amounting to one million dollars. Hmm. Due to this, we saw videos of shops being closed down by Ghanaian law enforcement with the traders, you know, complaining bitterly about what was going on. However, the Ghanaian Ministry of Trade had on Sunday rejected claims of the unfair treatment of Nigerians. Now, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Geoffrey Onyema, while uh, hosting a delegation of the progressive ambassadors of Nigeria, led by its president, Mr. Jasper Imenike, he expressed concern about the closure of the business premises of Nigerians in Ghana for alleged violation of trade regulations. But reacting to the development, the minister said that the Nigerian government had reached an agreement with Ghana over the Ghana Investment Promotion Council over a year ago, but then expressed concern that the matter was being reopened. He added that the Ghanaian regulations that stipulate that retail trade is the exclusive preserve of Ghanaians appear in conflict with ECOWAS protocol. He said, and I quote, what is the point of having an economic community if at the end of the day, each country will make laws and regulations that are in contradiction with the protocol? That is an issue that needs to be addressed. And he said, the first step we want to take is to be sure about all the facts. And so our Minister of Trade is going to engage his counterpart from Ghana we have summoned the Ghanaian High Commissioner who has given us information. We have the intention of calling, you know, others that are involved and we are also going to get in touch with ECOWAS to understand clearly what the ECOWAS perspective of this is and if this law is in contravention of the ECOWAS protocol. And he had a few other things to say. Um, but, but this is as far as it goes for now, you yeah. know, they're still <clears throat> carrying out, you know, certain steps before actually um, putting out a response or re a retaliation you know, to these recent actions towards uh, Nigerians in Ghana? Um, before me, I even, let's just, first of all, I just want to say, majority of the news stories in Africa, not only in Nigeria, in the whole of Africa, has nothing to do with what the people experience or what we, the people, want to hear or our ex existence. Okay. It is important that we know that news doesn't talk about our lack of proper education anymore, or inadequate education, inadequate healthcare, inadequate transportation, the things that really affect us as Africans, no longer in the news, it is these things that come from the top down, infighting of the elites, there are mistakes, but these are all the things that, you know, continually occupy the space of discussion, the narrative, so we cannot even now start even discussing the people's problems, Yes, you know, for me, it is, it is, it is weird, you know, uh, we are done, Ghana, Nigeria has you know, we did Ghana must go. Of course. You know, I mean, if there's any country in West Africa that has shown that it is a big man, it is Nigeria mm. that has tried to look down. You know, we've interfered in people's politics. We've, we've done anything. We are like a little America in West Africa, mm. you know, <laughs> with our uh, um, uh, flagrant abuse of other nations. We just yes. ban rice from all other. So what is our, what our, Interior Minister is saying, I don't understand, like, oh, what's the economic community? 
we just ban their own goods. Mm -hmm. Anytime any our own internal elites finally decide to, you know, do some product, who are the first people that we chase out of the market? It's fellow Africans from our economic community, you know. But that being said, I want to quickly touch on something that, you know, is not like, it's not in Ghana, but I, the Great Congo River, okay. or running out, out until it falls, this Great Falls in the Congo, right, is powerful enough, right, the f energy of the waterfall can power the whole Africa, mm. can give the whole of Africa power. So what should African leaders do is, what should they have done is that that's an opportunity for Pan-Africanist development. It's a project where all African rule, uh, all African people mm -hmm. should meet. It's a project where all African rulers have agreed, oh, we are going to do this. All African people will meet there. We will share cultures. We will be proud of ourselves, you know, that we accomplish something that is Pan-Africanist. Mm -hmm. There should be a highway from Cape Town to Cairo that all Africans are involved in building. No, but it's not. What they promote is Ghana versus Nigeria Jollof. <laughs> No, no, no. I want you people to understand that these things, these things are not oh trivial. Goodness, these things so are not trivial. We think they are trivial. But I want you to know that it is the duty of the African elite, yes. the position they've taken in the world imperialistic system, to sow divisions. Even internally in Nigeria, look at the amount of divisions they sow and call tribalism. As if Nigeria did not exist, we we'll, we'll have tribalism. Tribalism is a symptom of Nigeria. Without Nigeria, the Igbo man will not be oppressed by an outsider. The Yoruba will not be oppressed and outside like that. So it is them and their inability to develop Nigeria that creates this so-called tribalism. That is aside. So even within our brothers and sisters in Africa, they want to constantly create competition instead of oneness. Mm. They want to constantly That's create so competition. True. So our music, all these artists, they are competing. Uh, Ghana music, Nigeria music, uh, this one music, that one music. You go to... Um, Food, Nigeria jollof, Ghana jollof, Banku is better than your. I mean, where does it end? So now this this rule, it was put before this government came. That, yes. Oh, Ghana should be protected even before there was ECOWAS. That Ghana should be protected the retail because African people then were so poor that we could not even imagine that a Nigerian will have money to come from Nigeria wow. and come and open shop in Ghana. So this is the failure of the Ghanaian government themselves to understand the Pan-Africanist nature of that law. There was a time where we didn't even have the wherewithal to invest in ourselves like we can do now. And they should modify the law accordingly. Yeah. But they themselves are not seeing that, you know, because they don't understand that that law was put there because nothing, even today, what do we own in Africa? What do we own as Africans? What do we own in our own countries? In this Nigeria... How many things are foreign owned? How many things are uh, owned by locals? Mm. All our big companies, MTN, uh, DSTV, all these things, are they Nigerian? So this, the, the, so we need some kind of enclave for the locals to be able to gain wealth. Not only for the elites of Nigeria to gain wealth by creating monopolies for themselves. So mm. these laws, yes, they might be necessary, but they must be brought up to date to recognize the... Um, um, to recognize the um, uh, level that Africans have reached today in our own yeah. economic development, that's right? So I think that's where the Ghanaian government is is failing. But at the same time, the Nigerian government should not just try to even raise his nose up or, or to play the victim. Because if anybody is pushing this kind of mindset in West Africa, it is the Nigerian government. You know, with this, the, the, the relationship between Ghana and Nigeria, particularly, uh, I take it very personally because I lived in Ghana for a few years um, and I saw what the experience was like firsthand. Um, we've always had friction. We can take it as far back as uh, 1957, you know, Ghana being one of the first uh, 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 countries in that region to gain her independence. And so there was a mass exodus of some Nigerians to Ghana. And later on, like in the late 70s, we saw that a lot of Ghanaians started going to Nigeria for economic reasons. And there was a particular uh, Ghanaian president, I believe Busia or so, um, who then decided to implement the Alien Compliance Act um, or alien compliance order, um, saying that uh, there are a whole lot of African immigrants that were undocumented. Yeah. And guess who made most of the list, which was Nigerians, <laughs> and he decided to deport a lot of them. Now, 
later on in like 1983 or so, 1983 to be precise, Nigeria decided to retaliate. That's where the Ghana Moscow came from. And so some people might think, okay, but Ghana did it first. You know, why are they so pressed or so angry? I then realized that it was the situation surrounding Nigeria pushing for Ghana must go. At the time when they pushed for Ghana must go, that was a time where Ghana was going through like a, a, an extreme drought, an economic turmoil. And, and Nigeria too. And Nigeria too. Just and so me. and so about like a million or so Ghanaians were going back to Ghana. And so from that time, I believe that that really strained our relationship the more. And this now takes me towards the more interpersonal relationship between Ghanaians themselves and Nigerians, not necessarily the Ghanaian government and the Nigerian government. I just want to talk about the unconscious bias that emanated from the strain that came from them saying, uh, you know, uh, 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 Nigerians should leave Ghana and Ghanaians should leave Nigeria. And the truth is, whether we like it or not, that was a very difficult period for them. And of course, a lot of sentiments arose with bitterness and with sadness. And, you know, the, whole, the, the point that you had to move from somewhere that you called home back to your country where there was drought and economic turmoil. So just imagine, you know, the people of that time passing these sorts of sentiments from generation to generation to their children to their children's children about how Nigerians treated them badly. And I'm a, a, I'm, I'm a supporter and I would always be a supporter that leaders are a product of their community or their environment. I believe that strongly. So just imagine that these same children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Ghanaians that have taught them that this is what Nigerians did to us, inevitably those sentiments would still stand from generation to generation where in as much as we might be allies, in as much as we might be close, you know, countries to each other, we don't really like each other. This is why this show is called The People's Perspective, you know. Um, let me put that in um, the context of the people, right? So Busia, right, is the one that took power after Afrifa um, removed Nkrumah yeah. in Ghana. So you have to understand that Busia's economic policies, just like Shagari's economic policies, were failing. Mm. They were failing to meet the hopes and ambitions of Ghanaian people. Mm. Busia being a pro-imperialist, colonialist puppet to the core. You need to read it. This man said, before anything at all, I'm a Westerner. Mm -hmm. So when a man like Busia that says that, now tells you that as a Ghanaian, a Nigerian is a foreigner. Mm. You have to understand that he's protecting the real foreigners in Ghana. <laughs> the same thing Shagari did in Nigeria yeah. by telling Nigeria that foreigners were taking their job is the foreigners' fault, mm. pointing to other black people as the foreigners, right? Mm -hmm. While the real foreigners, we will can see them, oh, are never mentioned in their statement as um, as uh, foreigners in yes. Africa in any way. So even in South Africa today, which is now the booming country of Africa. Mm. Mm -hmm. Who are, they, who are they calling foreigners there? Yeah, that's so true. Black people. Other African nationals. Nigerians, Ghanaians, Zimbabweans, anybody that is of black is now called a foreigner. Mm. While the real foreigners are left alone to continue to hold on to the largest uh, piece of the pie. Exactly. So whether we don't understand it or not, in Africa right now, the largest piece of the pie is held by the real foreigners. Englishmen, American men, French companies, Lebanese, all these Arabs, all, they are the foreigners in Africa that severe laws should be put on their businesses. Severe taxation, high taxation, high licensing fees should be put on them for us Africans to enjoy. Yeah. But no... No. So, 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 so Shane, why do you think that? Because this, this, this weapon or this tool, you can trace it as far back as the slave masters. Yes. How they divided the different slaves, the ones for the, in, for the indoors and the outdoors. This, the since the uh, onset of our uh, um, um, destruction in Africa, yes. our demise as strong, um, uh, the demise of our strong nations is that the white imperialists, the Arabic imperialists have always had one number one ally in Africa mm. and that is the African merchant mm. okay. you know, willing to subvert to disobey, exactly. just they've always been mesmerized by things this mm. particular class, group of African people, who are now on top of us you know, due to their betrayal of their own, mm. you know, have always you know, so to them their brothers was what Miro, Jean so oh, they, they're yeah. not telling us the story Trinkets. because they are not the ones that rule us, right so they're not telling us the story as if that is the way all Africans were. Mm. Not that it was just them. Specific. You know? 
who are willing, they just mesmerized by things until today. That's why in our societies, the only expression these people have for their wealth is luxury, is things, things to show us, things that they've bought. They cannot, they talk about, oh, sit at the table, sit at the table. <laughs> Build your own table, where is the mind? All right, Sean, let's take some calls. <laughs> let's see things from different perspectives. Yeah, Lagos let the people Jones. chip in. <laughs> Lagos Talks, good morning, who's speaking? Good morning, Nifi. Hi, good morning, what's your name? Good morning. Remy, all right, let's hear you. How are you doing, Remy? I do, I do about, I do, I do. My side, I do. I um, I, well, I think the Ghanaian can't use the Ghana justify what is happening now. I don't think I did your wrong. There's a go by history. He did it first to us in 54 and 1969. So we can't use that as a on our job too. I'm just trying to clarify that because I want you to be doing mentioning Ghana Monsoon as an event in the mind of Ghanaian. I did, I did, I did mention. But that she also that mentioned the sure, initial. Sure, sure. Yeah, I did mention. Sure, sure, sure. Because I read so many comments from some Ghanaian, and you know we're using that as um why. Ooh, Ooh, please sorry. give us a call back. I'm not really sure why that. So I'm just gonna go through the phone line zero eight zero nine two three four five nine one three. 08092220913 and also 08091913913. Lagos Talks, good morning. Who's speaking, please? Yeah, good morning. Hey, All right, let's hear you quickly, Ebuka. Yeah, Mr. Shew. <laughs> are, are they fine where you don't show where the table is? <laughs> 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 God, tell you. Yeah, it's all here the competition. Instead of us to build a house together with a scatter mm. from within. Exactly. That, that, that we will say that brothers, they will be enemies among themselves. Now we have to come back and see the reason and see the people that are fighting us. Now the elites on the main news, you know, they talk about the, the factory things they put on, they pursue the, the neighboring countries to produce things. At the end of the day, they will play the price and at the end of the day, will be suffering. So why can't us, why, why not us just sit down and solve problem that is that is biting us on the field. I'm not looking at the outside. The South Africa they were complaining that uh, African guys are the one taking their job. Why the we put that the minute the land right at the hill yeah, thanks for calling. Right, well, thank yeah, you. because for me, that is the real issue about all this sewing division. I mean, even our artists, our celebrities, all these people sewing, finding these flames of superiority amongst ourselves. Yes. I even hear Nigerian musicians talking about how Nigerian music is the best music in Africa. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, who is doing this to us? Who is, who, is, who is doing this? Because for me, young African people, if they've not understood that we are stronger together. together. In this 2020, then yes. I mean. So, so what do you think is the best way for us to break out of that mindset or that mentality, which was a weapon that I believe that yeah. you could trace back to I mean, slave masters? The, right How back. do you think we can break out of that mentality as Africans? Is by owning the narrative. I think the narrative that we allow and our value system, you yeah. know, because we believe in a narrative that is anti-African. You know, so it is easier for us to fall in line with things that are anti-African. Yes. So that's what I'm saying. Like we can sit here and be talking about how other black people are foreigners in Africa, in Africa. I mean, imagine how brainwashed or indoctrinated you can you must have been hmm. to see other Africans in Africa as a foreigner, while you embrace the real foreigners in Africa. Let's <laughs> take more calls. Lagos talks. Hello. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Who's speaking, please? Morning. Uh, this is Ify. This is uh, Adeyemi. Hi, Adeyemi. Welcome. Very well. Very well. Uh, morning, uh, Sheung. Welcome. Oh. Thank you. Let me remind you of something. What Fela uh, said. He says, uh, Ila Sima do Wula Africa Afita Abara Tiwawe you know, that's uh, what she mm -hmm. has been talking about. Focusing on producing our own and doing our own thing and making sure that Africans are doing, using African uh, the good, uh, sorry, materials to be able to produce African goods. What are our people doing in Ghana? Are they selling Nigerian-made goods? No. 
supporting. Yes, they are not. So what, we are not developing ourselves. Why should we be selling these kids? You know, in Ghana, please let us build our country and make sure that whatever we have been able to build, then we can take it to anywhere in Africa or the world. That is where, when I will begin to support them, not when they are selling pure water or biscuits out there. It doesn't make any sense to me. God All bless right. Nigeria. All right, Ademi. Thank you very much. Lagos Fox. Hello, my name is Moses, coming from Ipaja. Hi, Moses. Welcome. Yes, yeah, so regarding the Nigeria-Ghana issue, okay. from what I understand, economically speaking, Nigeria has a trade surplus between itself and the, west of, the rest of West Africa, meaning we sell more to them than they sell to us. And the method of us strengthening our currency, but our government in their wisdom tries to shut the borders. And this affected Ghanaian business also. They couldn't really import to us as much. So if we tread the line of everything you both said from the relationship, that Ghana must go issue. Yes. And when you combine it with the border closure, you can't really blame them. I don't blame them. I blame our government. And that's it. I had also a friend who was also living there. She also had a business. She had to come back to Nigeria. Right. The, the point I'm saying is that so I went to Ghana to work, not because uh, I located to Ghana for anything, but that day she wanted to just do something where you're living. It is that bad that they can even evict you from a house just because you're in Nigeria. And That's so true. So you outside. Is that bad? Right? So it, 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 it's not uh, it's something that uh, uh, how I say it now. It's beyond some understanding. And, I, and I, I appreciate your analogy that you've made that uh, something that is passed from parents to kids and to their own children also. So it's going over time down the lane. But in essence, uh, it shows that our Nigerian government, like Shio has also mentioned, yes. that we are driving ourselves and say we are foreigners because we decide to put boundaries, but yet we are Africans. The real foreigners who are here collecting everything from us. We are leaving them and worshiping them. That is why you will see that you have uh, one country that will take people from here and say, you want to be out and to go and walk and go there and start enslaving our own people over there. All right. All right, Sebastian. All right, thank you very much. Okay, let's just read this and we'll move on okay. to the last story. Uh, this is coming from Wilson from England saying, Good morning, Ify and Cheryl. I believe that our major problem as Africans is inferiority complex. We don't believe in ourselves and our own. Yeah, I think that's true because we've been indoctrinated. Like, I mean, who wants to... I mean, when you're told as a child that it was one legislator that came to stop the killing of twins in Calabar. Okay, me as a Yoruba boy now, if it wasn't for Nigeria... I'll have no real affinity to Calabar people. But because we are all Nigerians, mm -hmm. when I hear Calabar people are killing twins, then I think Nigerians are killing twins. That's so true. I am capable of killing twins. So it's these white people that stopped us. So when they teach all these kind of things, you know, such irrelevant things, because it's so irrelevant, you know, to the larger picture of what Nigeria is. First of all, it's not as if Calabar people are the majority here. You know, and let's go to the real reason. Anyway, that's another story for history. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, it is the indoctrination, you know, that they, okay. that they put in our mindsets that make it quite hard, you know, for us to see ourselves in the true light and the true glory. You know, of, so, you know we should love each other. That's all. And that's true. I mean, that is not so difficult. Above all, just love you know? each other. Just love, respect, you know, and, just, uh, and have understanding, you know, yeah. for one another. I mean, and for some reason, the elites of Africa don't want, I mean, it is absolutely... Not in there. All right, let's move on to the last story. The coup in Mali. There was a coup in Mali. So what do we know? I'm just going to summarize this very quickly so that we can dissect it. It appears that some soldiers took control of the Kati army camp. There's about 15 kilometers from Bamako on Tuesday. They then marched on the capital. They were cheered by the crowds who had gathered to demand President Keita's resignation. 
Now the soldiers then stormed to the presidential building, arresting Mr. Keita and his prime minister <laughs> and taking them to the Kati camp. Now the president's son, the speaker of the National Assembly, the foreign and finance ministers were also reported to have been detained. Now it's seen to have been led by one Colonel Malik Dio, um, who is the deputy head of the Kati camp, and then another commander, General Sadio Kamara. Um, and um, really this is what's going on and the military is actually saying that what they're planning right now is a transition government into democracy um, but a more qualified individual, uh, a person of the people and the person that will move Mali out of its current situation. So we know that um, the citizens of Mali have gotten to a point where they're extremely tired of the corruption that is reading fabric of society. They're tired of the mismanagement of the economy. Um, they're tired of the insecurity that is being caused by jihadists. They're tired of the communal clashes that they're having and they have been demanding from weeks to months for the resignation of Keita and the military decided to come and do the deed and they, 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 they had a coup. Yeah, you know, I mean, same thing that happened in Zimbabwe two, three years ago yeah. when they kicked Mugabe out yeah. and people were jubilating yeah. and what's happening now in Zimbabwe? <laughs> well, they're not jubilating. Uh, they are getting shot like dogs on the That's streets. That's terrible. They've shut down their internet. They are all crying. All my Zimbabwe comrades, who I told that the military have no business running any country, being in any kind of political. See, if the military in Africa, in any country, if they feel they want to support the people of that country. All the military have to do is hold a press conference and say, we are siding with the protesters and we will support any civil and political arrangement that they decide upon and watch African people act. Hmm. You cannot be the same institutions protecting corruption. See, people have to understand the history of military in Africa. See, these military institutions in Africa are not of African people. We didn't train them. We didn't ideologize them, we didn't politicize them for African interest. The Nigerian military, for example, was created by white people. So you have to understand, the people in our military, that started our military, are those African people that decided to kill other African people no. to protect Western and Arabic interest. I repeat, the military in Africa are the institution that were willing to kill other African people, beat other African people, maim other African people, to protect the interest of Western organizations, governments, Arabic organizations in Africa. Mm -hmm. They are not of us. Go and look at our independence story. Anybody that knows about independence in Africa will see how the military immediately we... The, we okay, let me give you a story that connects all this. Okay. So you understand, you know, because in Africa, I think because... Our rulers understand that they are still alive. The perpetrators are still alive. Yeah. You know, it's not old history. <laughs> that we know. So they don't want to teach you because yeah. you start looking at, ah, so is this man, is this, he did this, he did... <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, let's look at a country like Congo. Congo is coming up today so much. Maybe because I just oh, read Ed Morel again recently. Um, Lumumba was the Congolese people's choice as a leader. After battling with the Belgians for independence, Congolese people went through some of the most, you know, if you read Congolese history, you find that the Congolese people went through some of the most brutal, I mean, be, before the Nuremberg trials of World War II, King Leopold was already charged because of Congo of crimes against humanity. You know, look at, in Congo, 10 million people compared to Hitler's 6 million Jews, you know. I don't like to compare atrocities, but just so that we see the magnitude. Yes. So, when um, Lumumba was pan-Africanizing Congo and removing Western, and the Westerners did not like what he was doing as a leader that refused to compromise, it was the military, it was a military man that they used to remove him. His name is Mobutu Seseseku. I'm sure you all know, if you know anything about Africa, you must have heard that name, Mobutu Seseseku. And we all know him as one of the worst leaders that ever. So this is Europeans backing Mobutu, a military man that they have trained, definitely. So this is what they do. 
they have put this their military in all our countries so that any time we the people of Africa decide to take our future into our hands, they will unleash this military on us to hijack whatever it is that we have fought for. You understand what I'm saying? The military in Africa is there to hijack anything African people fight for and return it to the hands of their Western and Arabic masters. You can quote me anywhere. I was, even if this is hate speech, I will stand on any court. I will open my evidence. So, you know what they did to Lumumba? Because Lumumba was protected, loved by his people. You know, they couldn't steal his mandate easily. Even Mobutu could not find him with his... They could not, so they brought in... They said they were, so the United Nations came with their peacekeeping force mm. to bring peace to the Congo. We hear of United Nations... You know, if you remember Rwanda too... People, one of you remember because you watch Hotel Rwanda. <laughs> but if you really look at that story of that Hotel Rwanda, the true story, yeah. the United Nations troops, they were 100 meters from the hotel. They didn't move one inch to help the people that were being killed there as soon as the foreigners were taken out. They allowed the Hutu militias to murder the Tutsi people in that hotel. The UN so-called peacekeeping force stood by and watched and said they did not have mandate to interfere in local issue. Mm. We do not wonder what they were there for at all. The, but in Congo, the UN peacekeeping force were the ones that went to arrest Lumumba. They shut down the national radio of Congo and handed Lumumba over to Mobutu and the Belgians. So when you remember that it's the UN that handed Mobutu, uh, Lumumba and then close our number, uh, the number one so-called freedom of information that the West claim and they, 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 they reverse so much. Close down the radio so that Lumumba could not arouse his supporters. So you see immediately the allegiance between our local military, foreign military and our local down pressures. I don't call them oppressor anymore. They are not ended. They are down pressures. So when you hear military coup in Africa, my brother and my sister run away. Mm -hmm. Run away from these people that are willing to destroy you for foreign interest. In I, I mean, in, in, in one second. All right, so, so, so Shion, what, there is a school of thought that actually does believe that if you introduce some form of disruption or shock into a political system, um, there's a possibility that it can lead to forms of political liberalization or maybe using it as a tool how many for shocks how many shocks see how many military regimes must we go to in africa to know that the military have no interest hmm. how many there has been one and this is why i like you know rules rules always have one exception that proves the rule so now among the military in nigeria there has been in africa there has been one military giant thomas sankara rose up from within the ranks of the military, completely pan-Africanist. Mm. From within the ranks of this international military that we have in Africa, calling them local military. military. It's true. <laughs> so, this Thomas Sankara rose up among them and was doing things for the benefit of his people, was even more advanced than many so-called civilian leaders who shot him in the back, the Burkina Faso military. Mm. His friend, uh, what was his name? Kampori, shot him in the back. So, this military guy, that rose up among them, was still killed by the military. Mm. Nigerian people, let me ask you a question. Since we're all Nigerians together. <laughs> if you are sleeping in your house at 2 a.m., middle of the night, you're in your house, you're sleeping, you hear a loud bang on your door. E boom, 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 boom. Boko Haram. Or you hear, e boom, 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 boom. Arm robber. Or boom, 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 boom. Nigerian army. Will you feel anything different? Hmm. Will wow, you feel anything that's very different? Profound. So, do you think a British man will be sleeping in his house? Will hear boom, 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 uh, uh, ISIS, boom, 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 uh, British, if uh, British general forces, and then he will feel the same thing he feels when he hear ISIS knocking. So the experience is the same. My brother and sister, please just I've told you this is people's perspective. Yeah. Always think about things from how it affects you. 
don't just listen to one narrative and just jump okay. on board. Okay, so, you know? so 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 um in, in a case where it, it is a country that they are going through um, a season or years of authoritarian governance, yes. how best would you say the people can rise up for democracy? But the people have risen up already. They've been they've been up for over a month. Even ECOWAS has been holding meetings between civil society and the government looking for a way, yeah. right? Who has been protecting them? Is it not the same military? So their own job is to say we are no longer protecting. Look at Egypt with Sisi, who hijacked the um, Egyptian people's uprising. Look at what he's doing today in Egypt, locking up um, journalists, doing what... Because, let me tell you, no matter how bad civilian rule is, military rule in Africa will be a hundred times worse. Hundred And what are we even saying? Everybody ruling us in Nigeria today is still from the military. They see us, what are we experiencing? What are we experiencing? I mean, let's use our experience now. Let's validate our own lives by using our experiences to judge what we are going through. Not some people's own um, abstract idea of what it is. And, and, and that's so true because, you know, because like I did mention, there is a school of thought that does believe that to an extent there is a way that coups can foster democracy. However, if you juxtapose the positives or the advantages and the disadvantages, you'd realize that the disadvantages outweigh, you know, the advantage or rather the advantages outweigh the disadvantages because in a sense where you'd see that if there is a coup, it lead to bloodshed. If there is a coup, it, it, there's a possibility that it's going to move into another tyrannical form of governance again. Um, it's a fact, not possibility. <laughs> if there is a coup, it means that you would probably have um, issues, relation relationship issues um, with other international bodies like ECOWAS suspending them and the UN as well condemning it. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, well, those ones are negotiating. Mm -hmm. as, as I said, we, we the people are not UN or ECOWAS. These are still our oppressors negotiating with the new guys. So according to you, they are our, our oppressors. They are negotiating with the We are not <laughs> even talking. Whatever they are doing is not for the people. ECOWAS banning them, UN banning them, is not on behalf of Malian people. Mm. It's so that they can negotiate with these new guys that Imboleti, Wagon, Kilon Shele, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you for ready? me, you know, what is, what is relevant, what is uh, super relevant as motherland people is that we look at a country like France where they've had yellow vest protests okay. for weeks and weeks and weeks. Military didn't come and do good. They've done two world wars. After fighting two world wars in Europe, they did not lose their government to their military. Mm -hmm. 60 million civilians, all government collapsed, but they still made sure that civilian rule came back. England, you've never heard of coup. Now, how did they make sure that so, civilian rule came back? So why is it that Fella asked the question and it's pertinent. In, in teacher, don't teach me nonsense. Because everything we are doing here, we are just following teacher without asking questions. Fella said, why uh, our people don't ask uh, uh, why Oibo when they were leaving? Mm. Because we have to understand that the British trained our politicians to do uh, political okay. civilian rule and handed Nigeria to them. And then they also did um, train our military yeah. and gave it. So why didn't they Fella said, why Oibo not tell army safe? That for England, I mean, no fee take over. Mm, good question. <laughs> okay, just to wrap this up very quickly. In a case where, because we've seen, you know, several African countries going through series of or, or seasons and years of authoritarian leadership, and sometimes you, during discussions you hear people talk about coups. Now, how is the best way? If people don't believe that their votes count, if people don't believe that protests actually do count, how is the best way to get the leadership and the government that you you so desire yeah. without a coup? The way is by organizing. By we, the professionals of Nigeria, who have been able to rise a bit out of the confusion or chaos that is our existence to create some kind of leverage for ourselves, right? We have to use that leverage, not for individual development, but for national development. Mm. To create platforms that will engage our young people positively towards national development. That All is right. the only way. Let's quickly take some more calls. There goes talks. We lost that one. Zero eight zero nine two three four five nine one three Lagos Talks. Good morning. Who's speaking? Hello. Hello, my name is Richard. All Costa. right. Let's hear you very quickly. You have thirty seconds. Yeah, Let's my last caller you. today. Tell me something nice. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, we're talking about what's happening in Mali. Yeah. So the people of Mali are rejoicing as the ousted government, and it's somewhat similar with what is happening in Nigeria. It's difficult to get those in power to be held accountable 
more so, or uh, if you even try to say you want to remove them from power, it is only those who have the All guns right. or who have some foreign Backbone. might that right. force some of these corrupt governments out of power. So I want to ask a Nigerian you, how can you possibly get these people out all right, my sentiments exactly. I do apologize, but we need to say goodbye. The news is about to come on, but it was, as always, an explosive episode. A big thank you to Sheon Kuti for taking us down history oh, lane. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. And yes, this and a whole lot more you would be getting from the people's perspective. Fridays, 11 a.m. to 12. Make it a date with us. A big thank you to everyone who was live on Sheon's Instagram, live on Lagos Talks Instagram. And if you missed today's episode, it's going to be on on our Instagram and our YouTube, Lagos Talks 913. A big thank you once again. Coming up next is the news. And Victor is right here in the studio.